In the berserk frenzy of thinking about situational, very nuanced solutions to the Fermi paradox that I've been doing of late, here's yet another one to contemplate. One of the more intriguing and compelling newer solutions to the Fermi paradox that have come to the forefront in recent years is known as the phosphorus problem. In a nutshell, the element phosphorus, for several reasons, seems to be rather scarce in the universe, and further, it's distributed in the galaxy in a rather spotty manner. I prefer to refer to it as the phosphorus question, however, the reason being that phosphorus actually has several problems in different ways, including issues of water pollution and high dependence in agriculture that isn't very renewable. But in the framework of the Fermi Paradox, phosphorus is the one element, a chink in the armor of life, that if not enough of it is present in a star system, there doesn't seem to be any way our brand of life could get started and sustain. Of course, there may be other forms of biochemistry in the universe not dependent on this, just our brand of life is. For those looking for a deeper dive into the phosphorus problem itself, I've linked to a video I did that gives an overview though now a little dated as I made it five years ago, and a much deeper, more recent dive done by my esteemed colleague Isaac Arthur. But in thinking about the phosphorus problem and watching the developments and understanding abiogenesis that have come out over the last two years, a realization hit me. The phosphorus problem solution to the Fermi paradox is actually much, much worse than it's normally been envisioned. The phosphorus problem starts with supernovae, when we look at supernovae remnants, not all of them are rich in phosphorus. That would suggest that not all supernovae, even those seemingly in the same classes, produce significant amounts of phosphorus, which in turn means that not all star systems are going to be heavily seeded with this element, enough for life to get going. But here's the problem. Simply getting your star system seeded with phosphorus by a nearby supernova isn't the only step in getting it in a position for abiogenesis to have enough of the element to be able to get going. Our solar system got lucky. It has ample phosphorus or we wouldn't be here. The levels do seem to vary around the solar system, and Earth's levels are unusually high, even for the solar system. But it's not unique to Earth. Phosphorus is found in meteorites, but was also recently identified in the plumes of Enceladus an encouraging sign for its liquid water subsurface ocean to have the nutrients needed for life. But a planet like Earth merely having phosphorus in its crust is actually not enough for abiogenesis, so far as scientists can tell. But also once life gets going, it's possible at some point to actually have too high of a concentration of nutrients, though that's really more of a problem for complex life and its relation to oxygen, a process known as eutrophication, a very serious and growing problem in our world today and one way of how waterways get polluted and messed up. So the current thinking here is that there must have been some other method of phosphorus delivery to the planet that supplied a consistent, constant supply of bioavailable phosphorus for life to use to get going. The problem is, up until very recently, as in last month, there didn't seem to be a ready way for this to happen. The natural suspect would have been the influx of meteorite and meteoroid material arriving at the surface of the Earth 3.7 billion years ago, which would have been significantly higher than what it gets today. Trouble is, the amounts of that possible at the time are not sufficient to have coated the Earth in enough phosphorus. So the meteoroid hypothesis never gained much traction until recently. Another long shot option is volcanism, more on that in a bit. The recent work in question hypothesizes that there is one way to concentrate meteoritic phosphorus on a planet's surface and get it into a body of water. One option are highly mineralized lakes, and the other is glaciers. Glaciers such as those in Antarctica function at a certain level like a conveyor belt. Indeed, meteorite hunting scientists in Antarctica use this effect, because as meteorites fall on the ice, they get trapped and transported across the continent to melt out at the edges of the glaciers, and deposit in convenient, concentrated areas to be picked up. As an aside, weirdly, there is a former mystery in this process only recently solved. The scientists collecting meteorites in Antarctica noted long ago that they very rarely ever find iron meteorites in the deposits. The distribution is far below what we find on regular land. So where are the Antarctic iron meteorites? Turns out when they fall on the ice and are then subject to the unrelenting sun during the six months Antarctica is in permanent daylight, the iron heats up 
and the meteorites sink into the ice below the conveyor belt layer and then just sit there. There are now plans for researchers to go down there with metal detecting equipment and ground ice penetrating radar to look for Antarctica's iron meteorites and dig them out. But back to the phosphorus question. The phosphorus in meteorites is specifically interesting because it comes relatively abundantly in the form of the mineral schreibersite. This is interesting because unlike most of Earth's phosphorus compounds, this one actually will readily react with organic chemistry. But you need to concentrate it somehow. So to concentrate the phosphorus from the meteoroids, the idea is that you need a melt pond at the terminator of the glacier, collecting it up in addition to sufficient phosphorus in your star system. That's two problems. But there's more, and here's where it gets much worse. You also need other factors to come into play. I should note here that the abiogenesis hypothesis I'm following here works under the assumption that it happened on land, which is the current favorite scenario, but another solid scenario is that it happened around an oceanic vent. This cannot be discounted because these vents have been shown to also be true geologic sources for phosphorus. Trouble is, most of the rest of the ocean doesn't have enough phosphorus, yet the earliest evidence of life on Earth is ocean-related. So if the process happened around those vents in the ocean, then this scenario goes out the window. So I have to caveat here and leave that option open. We just don't know. But recent discoveries on the land side of things paint a rather complicated picture in that they show that certain aspects of abiogenesis were easier than we thought. But the environment in which they can happen on land is actually very restrictive, almost as bad as the ocean. The first involves cell walls. Work by Deemer and Damer, linked to an Event Horizon interview I did with Dr. Deemer in the description below, show that lipid protocell walls can form in an environment where you have volcanic hot springs, periodically drying out, or partly drying out, and then rehydrating. Dr. Deemer did experiments in the very volcanic Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia and found this effect. The other work involved here is another recent discovery by Stephen Benner, involving just how RNA comes to be. Another link to his interview below as well. This was a huge question in abiogenesis, one of the greatest ones, that spawned numerous hypotheses about just how you get an RNA molecule to happen in nature. Some of these even involved ideas like radioactive beaches and all sorts of interesting ideas. But in the end, the answer seemingly was far simpler. Randomly assembled RNA comes out when you percolate nutrient-rich water through basaltic volcanic glasses. So put these three things together, glaciers, hot springs, and volcanic glasses, and the picture starts to resemble a volcanic mountain. And it has to be said, could enough phosphorus be produced by volcanic activity for the magic to happen without meteoroids? The problem that faces is that most of the phosphorus compounds thought to be around at the time produced by volcanic activity were water insoluble and not available to life. There are three places where this kind of environment is known to have occurred, though Venus remains up in the air on this count. Obviously Earth had it and it still does, sometimes catastrophically. One of the worst aspects of a volcanic eruption where glaciers are present are lahars, as those glaciers melt during a major eruption as would happen at Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980, huge amounts of water and wet volcanic ash come rushing down the river systems around the mountain to devastating effect. We also see this environment with Mars, which has enormous volcanoes that very likely once hosted glaciers as well. And we know from the Martian meteorites that it has plenty of basaltic glasses and very likely had hot springs when it had surface liquid water, meaning that Mars remains a very good candidate for once hosting the conditions for abiogenesis. And perhaps, just maybe, that might have happened. We just don't know. The third candidate is Io, which remains volcanic, but early in its history it's thought to have had as much water as Europa and the other Galilean moons. Thus it too at one point in its history seems to have had the ability for abiogenesis to occur in principle. But you also have to account for Jupiter's massive radiation torus, which might not have allowed for that process, at least on the surface. So not only do you need phosphorus, but you also need either a volcano with the right glacier resulting melt lake, volcanic rock and hot springs in proximity and in contact with the lake, or you need the right conditions, which are still very murky, pun intended, around an oceanic hydrothermal vent. 
All of those factors together could constitute a rare enough of a situational environment as to constitute a solution to the Fermi paradox, above and beyond just the phosphorus problem alone. In that the chemical soup and conditions needed for a biogenesis to occur is somewhat rare to begin with. In fairness, we don't fully understand the process of a biogenesis yet, but the environment alone and the phosphorus delivery and concentration issue might be a major factor that precludes it from happening very often. Adding another dimension to this is the Miller-Urey experiment. There the nutrients were added in a glass container, which was then subject to electricity. Out came sugars and all sorts of compounds life uses. But that experiment relied on using an electric arc specifically to simulate lightning. So you might also need to factor that into our volcanic lake scenario. It might have had to be struck by lightning regularly enough to provide even more of the constituents of life. But that's not really a big problem because volcanic ash clouds can produce lightning and so can weather. A potential problem for this rather situational and convoluted solution built on top of the phosphorus question is that we don't actually know if Earth 3.7 billion years ago even had any glaciers. This is going to be difficult to establish because almost nothing geologically is preserved from that time period on that level. We'll need to try to learn more through atmospheric science and attempts to reconstruct the conditions back then to infer the existence of glaciers that early. And it has to be noted again that this scenario doesn't really apply to the oceanic vent hypothesis, which is still in the running. There the phosphorus problem seems to simply stop at the supernova question. If a planet gets seeded with phosphorus, that phosphorus comes back out at the geothermal vents. But only if you have enough phosphorus in your geology to begin with. Lightning volcanoes, glaciers oh my, and the right kind of rocks. All with a supernova close enough, and of the right type, to provide the phosphorus. And that's just to get to the conditions needed for life to arise. There doesn't seem to be any clear guarantee though under those conditions that it will happen every time. If those conditions for example don't persist long enough, which for all we know might be centuries or more, or might be overnight, then it might not happen. Or it might not happen every time those conditions present themselves. We don't know. But even if it does, then there is a further problem. And that is the litany of other solutions to the Fermi paradox that come into the picture once life arises, such as the prokaryotic to eukaryotic leap, the development of photosynthesis, or the lack of that ever happening, and so on that may further limit what life can do. When you put all of that together though, and I hate to say it, but the great silence isn't so deafening any longer, and starts looking like an expected outcome and status quo for the universe at its current age. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently apologizing to the volcanic hydrothermal vents. As much as we can study the potential for abiogenesis to occur on land, there are always those vents. And if you think about it, it opens up a question. What if there are actually two ways for abiogenesis to happen? One on land, the other at the oceanic vents. If that's the case, then it very much changes the game and the paradox comes back in full force. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular, in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.